All right, this lesson we're going to be looking at Russia. Uh, this is the physical geography um, section of Russia, your first Roman numeral there. I'm going to go ahead and apologize up front for my voice. I'm going to do the best I can not to cough into the, uh, the microphone, but I can't promise that. All right, first thing we're going to look at is letter A, subsection, vast and varied. Rus Russia stretches across two continents, Europe and Asia. It's 6,200 miles wide at its extent. It stretches through 11 time zones, nine mountain ranges. It borders 13 seas, three oceans, and 14 other countries. Hence, Russia is huge. Subsection one, mountains and plateaus. There's three mountains, uh, and a or two mountains and a plateau I wanna look at with you. The first is the Ural Mountains, probably one of the most important mountain ranges in Russia. The Ural Mountains divide Europe from Russia, uh, from U Europe, Russia, from Asia, Russia. They run north and south. To the west of the Ural Mountains, you have the North European Plain. To the east, you have Siberia of Russia, basically. Um, and you're going to notice that population density is affected by these mountains, as most of the population is west of them. Then we have the Caucasus Mountains. The Caucasus Mountains lie between the Black and the Caspian Sea. We've talked about the Caucasus region before, the Caucasus, um, and these are the mountain ranges that separate them from Russia. Then the Central Siberian Plateau. This rugged boundary between Russia and China, um, although it is flat, is located in Siberia, and we're going to see how that comes into a play later. Number two, plains. The North European Plain is the western side of Russia. This is the warmest region. This region is best for farming and agriculture. Uh, it's the best region for farming and agriculture in all of Russia. This is Europe, Russia, again, because it's west of the Ural Mountains. The West Siberian Plain is one of the world's largest areas of flatland. However, Siberian word there, cold, basically, is what we're going to refer to that as kind of is going to reflect why the population density may not be that dense there. Then number three, coasts, seas, and lakes. Russia has the longest continuous coastline of any country in the world. Their coast touches the Arctic and the Pacific Oceans. The Black Sea is Russia's warm water outlet to the Aegean and the Mediterranean Sea. You'll notice when you look at a map of Russia that there's a little bitty area in Europe that's actually part of Russia. This is a warm water port into the Black Sea that's very, very, very influential. Now, the reason why a warm water port is so influential is that the Black Sea is not going to be frozen at any point. Hence, warm water. Then you have the Caspian Sea. Caspian Sea is on Russia's southwestern border. It's the largest inland body of water in the world. Then Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal can be found in southern Siberia. 20% of Earth's fresh water is located here. Then moving on to rivers. Some of the world's longest rivers flow through Russia. And you can see on this map here um, that there's quite a bit of rivers uh, that run through Russia. One, and probably the most important river in Russia, is the Volga. The Volga is in European Russia. That means it lies west of the Ural Mountains. Uh, it's in that North European Plain region. This is the fourth longest river in Russia. Now its length is not necessarily what makes it um, so important. Uh, this, this river, the Volga, is vital to Russia, meaning they need it for survival. So much so that it's even called the Mother Volga, uh, the mother of Russia, basically. It does provide hydroelectric power, electricity that's fueled, uh, th that runs through dams, that's fueled, um, that fuels electricity. <clears throat> but it does so even though for half of the year it's frozen. Uh, so half of the year it's moving and they're using it for hydroelectric power. Uh, but also it's in the trade and manufacturing uh, sector of Russia. This is where most of your major cities are, where most of your population is. So it can be used for transportation purposes uh, and it can be used for those things um, inside of Russia. And then, I'm going to draw a little line there for the Ural Mountains. 
East of that mountain, of the Ural Mountains, you have the you have Siberia. Siberia has some important rivers. One, the Ob. You could see it there. Um, another one that we have is the Yenisei River. You also have uh, the Lena River, which you could see there. Um, and there's also an Irtush River um, that, that's not really labeled, but it's running through this region of Irkutsk um, that, that's influential to Siberia, Russia. These Siberian rivers flow north through Siberia to the Arctic Ocean. So they're flowing north this way towards the Arctic Ocean and draining into the Arctic Ocean. And then moving on to natural resources. First thing I want to look at is minerals and energy. Uh, one thing that you'll notice on this is uh, the petroleum deposits, which are marked by this barrel here. The petroleum deposits, you can see that over most of Russia. Um, petroleum is one of the most important natural resources found in Russia in regards to minerals and energy. 16% um, of the world's coal can be found here. Um, and you can see that marked by the little pickaxe there uh, in, in all of those regions that they are found in Russia. There's more dry natural gas in Russia than in any other country in the world. Um, and you can see the natural gas marked by that little flame there. Uh, and you can see where it runs throughout Russia. Rivers make this region the world's leading producer of hydroelectric power. And you can see that marked there with a little lightning bolt um, throughout the area. In these natural resources, this is what makes Siberia such an important re uh, region. Is It's natural resources that are available. Um, natural gas... You've got coal available, you even have some hydroelectricity, you have some uranium available, you have different precious metals that are found in the area. So it's really these natural resources that make Siberia so, so influential. Because of its abundance, the natural resources have expanded Siberia's industry and trade, and it made Siberia very, very, uh, very, very valuable um, to Russia because otherwise... They wouldn't care so much about it because most of their population is in this green zone here in the North European plain on the western side of those Ural Mountains because of the temperature. But these natural resources make Siberia important. Cha-ching! Then you have number two, soil and forest land. Um, you'll notice by the economic activity map that really and truly uh, when you're looking at commercial farming, uh, and then when you're looking at forestry, you don't really have a lot in this area. you got little bitty pockets of forestry in a couple of areas. Um, and then you have a little bit of commercial farming uh, in these areas that are warm. And a little bit over here in Asia. But really and truly, as a whole, you don't have a whole lot of farming or forestry going on. Um, and a lot of that has to do with that only 10% of the land can support commercial farming um, and forestry. And a lot of that has to do with the temperature. It's just way too cold in most of this area. And then Roman numeral two, climate and vegetation. This one won't take us very long, and you could probably imagine why. Letter A, Russia's climate and vegetation. Most of Russia has a very harsh climate with long, cold winters and short, relatively cool summers. Russia can be characterized by temperature extremes because you have some of the coldest temperatures on Earth recorded in Russia. Letter B, high latitude climate zones. Your high latitude climate zones are extremely cold winters and short summers. Um, one of the um, vegetations that you're going to see here is the tundra. I uh, don't have a color to mark that. Uh, that's, that's the same, but you could see the tundra located in the far, far north here, and then a little bitty pocket there um, of tundra. You could see that area there. Uh, almost all of north of the Arctic Circle um, is tundra in that Arctic Circle. You could see here this dotted line. Uh, almost all of this north of the, of the Arctic Circle, um, you, could, you can chop up as uh, being a tundra. Uh, the tundra covers 10% of Russia, and again, it's all above that 66.5 degree north line, which is the Arctic Circle. And then we've got the subarctic. Again, I don't have a color that will match that very well. I'm just going to go with black. 
Uh, but the subarctic zone, you could see just below the tundra, uh, and then it stretches into most of Siberia, you're going to uh, say is subarctic. This is Russia's dominant climate. There is more subarctic than anything else in Russia, uh, and it dominates its climate. Some of the world's coldest temperatures occur in the subarctic zone, even though it's not as far north um, as the tundra. 120 to 250 days a year, snow covers the ground. I can't express enough that it is cold. Now, um, the vegetation zone of this area, a lot of what you're going to see, and I'll do my best to write neatly, is a taiga. This is a lot of what you're going to see in regards to um, vegetation zone. The taiga is a forest belt that covers two-fifths of European Russia, and it extends into much of Siberia. Um, so it's kind of this area here is going to be your taiga belt zone. So again, it is west of the Ural Mountains in the North European Plain, um, and it's two-fifths of that, and then it extends into much of Siberia. Because of this, the major economic activity of taiga is going to be timber. The reason timber is going to be your main economic activity of taiga is because the definition of taiga is a forest belt, meaning a lot of trees. So naturally, the timber industry will be very, very uh, profitable for you. Um, keeping warm uh, in Russia and in Taiga uses a great deal of energy, and a lot of this energy comes from oil, um, gas, wood, or coal. But a lot of Russians have to take a great deal of time and get this energy, uh, get this fuel, so that they can stay warm, because it's cold. Also, builders in Russia have to use special types of steel so that it won't crack in the cold. Um, they have to be very, very careful with what they use because it does reach extreme temperature uh, coldness. And then moving on to your mid-latitude climates, um, one of the areas that we're looking at in regards to mid-latitude climates is your humid continental zone. Um, you could see that here in the North European Plain and then a little part of Siberia, as well as close to China. I'm on the southeastern part of Russia. The humid continental zone, uh, most of Russia's North European plain is the humid continental zone, um, which again you could chalk up as this area here. And then you also have small parts of Siberia um, in your humid continental zone. Your humid continental zone is going to be a coniferous taiga. Remember the taiga was this tree belt um, that, that we talked about, which was all in this region. Uh, but again, the humid continental zone, which is kind of in this, these areas here, uh, you're going to have the taiga uh, in there as well. And then it gives way to a mixed deciduous coniferous forest. Remember the deciduous trees are the trees that lose their leaves in the fall. Coniferous trees are the ones that have cones um, as seeds. Uh, and then they also are going to have the pine needles. Um, your western side of the Ural Mountains, they experience warm continental winds which make their way over from Europe. Remember you have the North Atlantic Drift, um, which is these warm winds that stretch across Europe and the Ural Mountains are going to block these winds and so the area west of the Ural Mountains are going to be kind of warmer. Um, but then the eastern side, uh, these are going to be warmer and wetter, I'm sorry, because you have the moisture from the seas and from the ocean over here in Europe um, that's going to stop. And you don't really have a rain shadow effect per se, meaning you don't have a desert right here, but you have less moisture that makes its way over these mountain barriers of the Ural Mountains. And it also keeps the warm winds from making their way across. So they get here and they stop. Uh, but then on this other side, because of your zone of the Arctic, uh, it's going to be really, 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 really cold. And then last but not least, you have the steppe climate zone. Not to be confused with steppe. Um, it's called the steppe. Now this map that we're looking at here calls it semi-arid. Uh, it's the same thing. Okay, um, Your steppe zone, this zone has uh, temperate grassland areas. Uh, you can see that marked here on your vegetation map in pink. Um, temperate grassland areas with dry summers and long, cold, dry winters. Your steppe climate zone, uh, you can see this is in the southern part of Russia. Uh, it borders the Black and the Caspian Seas down here is where most of it is. And then you have thin strips that stretch away uh, in other parts along the area, especially along the Kazakhstan border uh, here. Uh, and, and that's where your steppe is going to be found.